The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you ask somebody for help, and if that person ignores you, how are you going to feel about that person? Probably kind of angry, right? Probably a little put off that somebody would ignore your question or your request for help. You might feel that that person doesn't like you for some reason. And that's why he won't help you or even answer your request. Well, today, we see somebody who asks Jesus for help. A woman who comes to him and Jesus ignores her. You might not think that that Jesus would do such a thing, but he did. But it wasn't because he didn't like her. It was because he was testing her faith. It looked like this woman was different than Jesus. She was from a different land. And, and there were some things that were different, such that maybe it did look like Jesus didn't like her. But we see that Jesus actually loved her. And he helped her. And he complimented her on her great faith. And there are other examples in the Bible where, where God helped people. People from many different lands. Because that's what God does. He helps all people who call on him and who trust in him. But you know as well as I do, that he doesn't always help right away. He doesn't always help us as fast as we would like him to help us. And maybe it feels like he's ignoring us. But Jesus gives you and me the opportunity, just as he gave to that woman, to express our faith in him. And today, as we trust in his promises, Jesus says of us that we too have great faith. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we come to you today for help, for all of our problems and troubles. But we also know that 
you have your good plan for us. And sometimes that means that we have to wait for your help. Work through your word in us that as we wait for your help with all of our troubles, we will grow in our trust in you so that you will say of us that we have great faith. Amen. In our Old Testament lesson, we see an example of a woman from a different people than the Israelites who had faith in the Lord as her Savior. Uh, the Old Testament lesson is written in the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Before the spies lay down for the night, she, that is Rahab, went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the man answered her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, Go to the hills, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. He will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is Psalm 133 and 134. We read responsively. How good and pleasant it is for there the Lord bestows his blessing. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, we stand for the words of Jesus. The Holy Gospel from Matthew chapter 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, 
You have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The hymn of the day, when in the hour of utmost need. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. There was another police shooting this week. It happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A man named Jacob Blake was shot in the back and paralyzed. Since then, there have been more protests and riots because people are upset about what has happened. Some people tend to 
sympathize with the man who was shot and the people who are protesting what happened to him. Other people tend to sympathize with the police and those who are supporting them. We may feel like we have more in common with one group or the other group, but as we witness it from our own place, we see that divisions are deepening and tensions are being raised ever tighter. Of course, ethnic tensions are nothing new. And for a long time, people who look at how the world works differently than other people have had disagreements with each other. It's something that even has had to be dealt with within the Christian church. It's something that was a problem in the early Christian church between the Jews and the Gentiles. Shortly after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the Christian church was made up almost exclusively of Jews. At that time, uh, the people were of Jewish descent who had come to hear the good news that Jesus was their Savior, and, and it was to people in Jerusalem and the surrounding area that that gospel first went. But as time went on, and the reach of the gospel extended further, Gentiles began to hear that good news and become members of the Christian church as well. At first, we read in the scriptures about how many of the Jews treated the Gentiles as second-class citizens. And that was something that the Apostle Paul had to deal with as he was the one who took the gospel further to the Gentiles. But then as time went on, as more and more Gentiles were hearing the word of God, soon there were more Gentiles in the Christian church than there were Jews. And the Gentiles were then tempted to become arrogant and to think that they were somehow better than the people of Jewish descent. And then the Apostle Paul had to deal with that problem too. And this is one of the problems one of the issues that he wrote about in his letter to the Romans. The Christian church in the city of Rome was made up of both Jews and Gentiles, probably in roughly equal number. And those people had questions about their relationship to each other. And Paul had grief in his own heart about his fellow Jews. As Paul traveled to different cities to spread the gospel on his missionary journeys, he always started with the Jews, taking the gospel of Jesus first to them. But it always happened that before too long, those Jewish people rejected the gospel of Jesus. Not all of them, but most of them. And so Paul was forced to then go and preach to the Gentiles. And many more Gentiles in those cities believed the news that Paul preached than the Jews. And so Paul could say that it really was because of the rejection of the Jews that the gospel went to the Gentiles and that they received the blessings that God gives through his word. But that was no excuse 
for the Gentiles to become arrogant. Because the Lord still had plans to work in the hearts of Jewish people too. Paul grieved over the fact that his fellow Jews rejected his word, but he had hope that as more Gentiles came to believe in the Savior, and as God poured his blessings into their lives, that Jewish people would see the blessings that the Gentiles were receiving, and that some of them would come back to hear God's word again, and would receive those blessings too. And so you see, just as the Jews had a role in God's plan of salvation to the Gentiles, as the Savior had first come to their nation, and it had been Jewish people who first carried the gospel to the Gentiles. So now, Paul said that the Gentiles had a role in God's plan of bringing salvation to the Jews. That they would see God's work among the Gentiles, and they too would hear and believe. That's what Paul said when he turned to the Gentiles in his letter to the Romans and spoke directly to them, saying, I am talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? It was that the message, as the message came to the Gentiles, that God reconciled them to himself. The Gentiles had been God's enemies. They hadn't believed or trusted in him. And so they couldn't be arrogant as though they deserved God's blessings. It had been by God's gracious choice that he had brought them his gospel message and brought them into his church. But God wanted to work another miracle, that by his grace he would preserve a remnant among the Jews and bring more Jews to believe in him and raise them from spiritual death to spiritual life. Paul concludes his argument in Romans chapter 11 when he says, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. Paul, of course, was no anti-Semite. He was a Jew himself. But he had to confess that the vast majority of his fellow Jews were enemies of the gospel. The Gentiles had come to believe in God's message. At least many of them had. But that didn't mean that God had now forsaken the Jews. Paul had worked as hard as he possibly could to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. But he was also still at work to bring his good news to his fellow Jews. And he wanted his Gentile believers to play a role in that work so that they could extend the gospel back to the Jewish people. 
God hadn't given up on the Jewish people. He still loved them. He still remembered his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors, who had believed in the coming Savior and had been saved through faith. And so who was to say that their descendants, the Jews of Paul's own day, couldn't also hear that message and believe? Paul said, though Jews were being disobedient to God, the Gentiles had been disobedient to God too. They didn't deserve anything more from God than those Jews did. The reason that the Gentiles came to believe was because God was having mercy on them. And God wanted to have mercy on everybody. This lesson that Paul taught the Roman Christians about the relationship of the Jews and the Gentiles wasn't just for them long ago. It's also written for our benefit because we see tensions between ethnic groups. We see racial divides in our world. We see divisions between people who think that what they believe is true and what everybody else believes is false. And so, what do God's words to the Roman Christians teach us when we see people fighting today? Well, when we look at the strife and the tension that exists in our world, like what's going on in Kenosha right now, or, or Portland, or Seattle, or many other cities across our nation, we might be drawn to one side of that fight or to the other side of the fight. With which of these groups do we sympathize? With, with the protesters or with the police? Which of these groups do we have more in common with? Well, today as we study the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles in the early church, we see that the answer is we have everything in common with both groups. That's not what the politicians are saying, of course. They like to draw out the differences between people and, and highlight how these people just can't get along, at least without their help. And it's no surprise that they say those things because we're tempted to see the same thing, to see that that other group of people with which we don't agree, to think that they're fundamentally different than we are, and that we could never have anything in common with them. It's as though one group is righteous, and the other group is disobedient. But in reality, both groups are disobedient. All people on every side of the disagreement is by nature disobedient to God. You and I also are by nature disobedient to God. And so we can't look at anybody else 
no matter how different they appear from you and me, and think that we're better than they are. No matter what kind of disobedient things that they're doing with their life, they're fundamentally the same as we are. By nature sinful. And in need of a savior to come and rescue them. And that's just what has happened. Jesus came and was obedient in our place and in place of the world. With his life and death, he has saved us and everybody from what we deserve. Yes, through Christ, God has shown mercy to us, not giving us what we deserve, but instead giving us his blessings as his gift to us. And God has sent his messengers to us to bring his gospel message to you and me so that we can believe in him as our Savior and through faith we are made righteous, declared righteous in God's sight. This is God's gift to you and me. And now that you and I have heard this good news of God's love to the world through Jesus Christ, you and I now have a role to play as this message goes to the other people of our world. To the people who, in the past, we may have seen as different than we are. But now through God's word, we know that they are fundamentally the same. And that the same Savior who has saved us from our sins and given us eternal life is their Savior too. That's because God's mercy is for all. The division and the discord in this world make us sad. But you and I have the one message that can overcome these tensions and differences. We have the good news of a savior for the world. And just as that good news has come to us, so we proclaim this message to our world to bring the good news of Jesus and all the blessings that flow from him to everybody. And that good news will change people's hearts and will conquer divisions and will bring people God's blessings. People who may look completely different than us they'll come to faith in the same Savior and receive the same forgiveness. And one day, we will stand with all kinds of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, from different lands and languages, people who have different opinions and ideas than we have, and we'll stand before the same throne, in the same heaven, praising the same God. Because God has mercy on all. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the Christian faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten God and made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. us to be your own for all eternity. You have made us your witnesses in this world to lost sinners. We thank you for the high privilege of working with you to gather your elect into your kingdom. As you looked with compassion on the lost sheep of Israel, grant that your Holy Spirit may move us to look with compassion on the people of our day. Fill us with zeal to do all we can to bring them the precious gospel so that they too may experience the joy of being your disciples. Enable us to be faithful witnesses to all whose lives we touch, whether it be in the privacy of our homes or in our communities. We pray that your word would also be proclaimed in distant lands. Bring those who hear the word to repentance and faith, Look with compassion on all people, especially those who are suffering. Give help and relief to all who are in need. Although we have failed you, Lord, we have learned to know you as a merciful God. We ask you, therefore, to forgive us for the times when we have failed to share the message of your love with those who need it most. Renew us. Restore us and use us to proclaim your love by word and deed to all people, near and far. May many more rejoice with us, and we with them, when together we stand before your throne of glory. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.